Continuing on with chapter 19, Sticky Notes, we just finished page 532, and so we're going to turn the page to 534. So on 534, you need to know that extracting fossil fuels is also a problem. So not just burning, but extracting causes problems. So we can get methane in the air from extraction, um, especially with accidents. We can get a lot of particulate matter from habitat loss, from um, clearing the land, letting dust go loose, or even just mining for coal. A lot of that coal dust goes airborne, so that's particulate matter. We have primary and secondary extraction of oil. So primary is just, boom, you lower a, a drill down here, and then the pressure releases it, and we capture it up here in the oil rig. That's primary. Secondary is where it's embedded in rock, and we have to crack the rock, so it's fracking, um, and so here is your injection. Sometimes they inject chemicals, sometimes they inject water to crack the rock to get it up. So that's called secondary extraction. So you need to know what fracking is. So the official name of fracking is fracturing technique, but most people call it fracking. Um, it's where we can pump water or sand and or chemicals into the rocks to crack it and extract natural gas or oil too. So we can use fracking for oil, not just natural gas. The problem that we saw way back in chapter seven when we studied this as part of the case study um, was that it often gets into our aquifers. So it, you get natural gas and those chemicals into our well water. And that's a big problem. And right now, um, the law excludes these companies from disclosing their chemicals because they're like, well, if we let you, people know what chemicals they are, then our competitors will use those chemicals. And so if people um, that live farmland near a place, so let's say your neighbor decides to lease his or her land for fracking and they live next door to you and you share the same aquifer for your well water, for your drinking water, um, that fracking can contaminate your drinking water. And this is a big problem all over the US. You need to 100%, don't just look at this as a recommendation, you 100% need to go back to 162 on chapter seven and look at the pros and cons of, of fracking. So we're revisiting fracking in this chapter and it's extremely important to know and understand, so you need to go back and do that. Turn the page to 537. So you hear especially politicians talk a lot about clean coal technology because we have an abundance of coal in the United States. They say we have like a 200 year supply of coal. So people wanna use this. They want to use what we currently have for energy how can we make it cleaner? So we already know a few. We have wet scrubbers for sulfur dioxide. We have electrostatic precipitators. There's a couple more we learned about in the last chapter, bag house filter, fluidized bed combustion. Those are other ways to clean up um, the air. There's something else called gasification of coal and then carbon capture and depositing underground, which is still experimental, but a lot of people are working on that technology to carbon capture so that we could use coal as an energy source. It's not great. Frankly, the clean coal technologies still just don't do such a great job. Um, so for our health wise, it's better to look at renewables, but there are also a lot of people working on um, clean coal technologies. Again, because it's abundant and it's kind of cheap, coal is. Um, turning the page to 538, you need to know about carbon capture, some ideas. So this graphic and figure kind of shows what they're looking at to try to capture or sequester the carbon back underground. So we dug up the coal, we dug up the oil from underground. Can we put the carbon back there? And there's a lot of people working on that. So even though um, you know, even if we phase out coal and phase out natural gas, there's still a lot of 
carbon in the atmosphere that we would like to get rid of because it causes climate change. So this isn't anything that trying to capture this carbon is something that as we would go to renewables, we'll still need to get rid of the carbon that we have emitted over the past uh, 150, 200 years of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, going to page 539, know that there's been a couple of really bad problems from oil spills. The most recent one and the worst one happened in the Gulf of Mexico, the Deep Water Horizon. And here's a picture of it down here. This oil platform had just been built, just finished, and it exploded. Um, several people died, the others had to be evacuated, and then it sunk. But what happened is, is once you hit an oil deposit underground, the pressure makes it keep coming out. And so you, it's very difficult to stop that leak. It, it took several months for them to be able to plug the leak. And in the meantime, it just kept pumping out, pumping out, pumping out oil all over the Gulf of Mexico, which washed up on shore. It was terrible when this happened. You also need to know about the Exxon Valdez, which ran aground in Alaska and spilled a bunch of oil up there. It was, a bar, it was an oil uh, tanker ship. You need to know the impacts of oil spills, so make sure that you read these two pages, which discuss the problems with oil spills. You can also read about it here, the impacts of oil spills around here. Um, they are still assessing the damage because the oil landed ashore in all of these states. And they're still examining the long-term effects here um, of the ecosystem. And it still hasn't fully recovered. The Exxon Valdez happened two decades ago, and it still hasn't fully recovered from that major oil spill in Alaska. Okay, 542. One of the big problems we have with coal, and we'll learn more about this when we study mining in chapter 23, is mountaintop removal to get coal. So basically they just chop off the full top of a mountain to extract coal. Some of the things that oil extraction does is um, you have fra uh, habitat fragment from roads to drilling sites, which some species will not cross a road, so now you've limited their habitat. Um, when we build ha um, homes for the workers, pipelines for the oil, and waste piles when we dig out um, underground for the oil, um, or when we do um, strip mining for the tar sands, it creates waste piles. Some of the problems, um, other problems with the natural gas is that they can leak. So really close to us over the hill in Porter Ranch, so it's part of LA City, they had a gas leak a couple of years ago in Aliso Canyon. So it released so much methane, it was like that leak um, produced more methane than the whole year of the whole United States produces in methane. It, it was really terrible. Um, and then a lot of people got sick who were le living in Porter Ranch near this um, natural gas leak. All right, turn a couple of pages to 546. So the AP test needs uh, to make sure that you guys understand solutions. That is one of our science practices to be able to pick out solutions in a multiple choice test or to write about it in an FRQ. So here are some solutions to reduce the amount of fossil fuels we use or just energy in general. We um, can have something called cafe standards, which we'll talk about in a second. You can buy a car with high miles per gallon. You can insulate your buildings to prevent loss of heat or air conditioning so you use less because most of our electricity and heat is from fossil fuels. The vast majority is still fossil fuels. You can buy Energy Star appliances which use less energy. You can do more efficient lighting like LED bowls that use less electricity. You need to know cogeneration. This is also another favorite thing on the AP test. They'll, let, they'll be uh, on a multiple choice. Which of the following is an example of cogeneration? So you need to be, and it probably won't be one of these, but read through these to know a couple of examples 
But then on the AP test, you need to apply your knowledge. So they'll probably give you um, a couple of examples that aren't on here and you need to be able to pick them out and reason through which one sounds like cogeneration. All right, page four, um, going on to 547. Over here, we have CAFE standards for CAR. So CAFE standards is, uh, is an acronym, stands for Corporate Auto Fleet Emissions. So we have a minimum miles per gallon that your fleet of cars in your company can have. Um, so Toyota um, is the company, and if some of their cars get low miles per gallon, then they have to have some and sell enough to get high miles per gallon. So often they have sales on the cars that get high miles per gallon. If they're not selling very well, then they'll try and push those. So it has to be the cars that are sold. They have to meet a minimum average miles per gallon for fuel economy. And this lessens the air pollution, lessens greenhouse gases. So those are good things. Um, also on page 547, you need to know what baseline power is. So in our electric grid around the country, we have to have a minimum amount of electrons needed at all times. So we can always burn coal. We can always run our um, hydroelectric dams and we can always turn on nu or actually nuclear. You can't stop. Once you start nuclear, you can't stop nuclear. And we'll talk about that next chapter. Um, so these are all really good for baseline power. Um, and again, you have to, because when you turn on the light in your house, you need light immediately. So there has to be electrons flowing in the wires all the time. It can't be like, oh, everybody in the morning is turning on their lights. Okay, now let's put some coal and start burning the coal. And then it takes 15 minutes before it gets to your house. You can't do that. So there has to be electricity running through the wires at all times. And we call this baseline power. The problem is, is that it's very, um, we lose a lot of power by keeping the electrons there all the time. So one of the things that we can do is upgrade to a smart grid. And that's going to cost billions of dollars in the whole United States to upgrade our infrastructure. But in, a lot of people say, you know, updating our power grid to a smart grid to make it more efficient and to not lose this power would be a lot cheaper than switching to renewables. So that is something people talk about as well. And then the last sticky note on page 548, you need to know here's other solutions. So the government can prov promote energy conservation in a few ways. Now remember, we live in a democracy and we can't say, and we also live in a free market, um, well, kind of free market, it's not totally free market, but we can't do draconian measures like ban all gas autos and things like that. We can ease into these things, um, but we can promote things through tax breaks um, or rebates for energy efficient appliances. Um, California used to give a lot of tax breaks when people put solar on their houses so they could get money back in their taxes. Um, they allow hybrid cars in the carpool lane with a single driver. They used to do that. They don't so much anymore because now there's so many people with hybrid cars. Um, they can do the cafe standards. We can choose to subsidize and um, have our tax money prop up solar wind instead of coal and oil. So these are the things a democracy can do. So you need to know these for the AP test. Very, very common question, at least one on your FRQ, what can a government do? And you have to know things like tax credits, tax breaks, subsidies, these kinds of things for anything, not just energy conservation, but for any kind of a solution thing, it has to work within a democracy. All right, and that's it for chapter 19.